Our next speaker is Dr. John Amori. He is an assistant uh, professor of surgery at Case Western Re Reserve University School of Medicine and a fellow at the American College of Surgeons. He completed his undergraduate and medical degrees at University of Michigan, um, where he continued as a general surgery resident. We're, we're far enough away from Columbus so we don't have to hate him. Um, <laughs> He went on to complete a surgical oncology fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and he is going to talk to us about updates in surgery. Dr. Moore. Thank you, uh, Jerry and Patty, uh, Tater, and uh, Dr. Kyler for the invitation to talk about uh, advances in surgery for primary colorectal cancer as well as uh, liver metastases from colon cancer. So surgery is the primary curative therapy for colon cancer and rectal cancer. My objectives for this talk will be to cover these concepts. So number one is to define the concepts of total mesorectal excision and complete mesocolic excision. Two is for you to recognize the data regarding laparoscopic colectomy, to be able to compare the minimally invasive techniques used in rectal cancer surgery, and describe the indications used for liver-directed surgery for colorectal metastases. And the outline of my talk will basically cover these objectives. <clears throat> I'll start with total mesorectal excision and complete mesocolic excision. Total mesorectal excision is a concept initially introduced by a British surgeon named Bill Heald in 1982. Concept is removal of the intact package, including the rectal cancer as well as the main lymphatic drainage, which is embodied in a, a package of fat and surrounded by a visceral fascia. And the key part of this is to preserve the integrity of that visceral fascia as you're doing the surgery. This technique has reduced the local recurrence rate from rectal cancer from in the 20 to 30 percent range back in the 1970s and early 80s to less than 10 percent these days. And it's really the standard for optimal rectal cancer surgery. This is, this is the way rectal cancer surgery should be performed and, and is performed. And here's just a picture of what this means. So high ligation of the blood vessels, which is a tie right here, and these are the lymph nodes, and this is that glistening mesorectal package with all the lymph nodes and no break in this peritoneum. So total mesorectal excision is the standard in rectal cancer surgery. So for colon cancer surgery in 2008, a similar concept was proposed by Dr. Hohenberger in Europe. And really, the principles are very similar to TME, or total mesorectal excision. The concept is to remove the mesentery with a complete envelope of fascia and visceral peritoneum containing the lymph nodes. There's a central vascular tie, again, right in this area in order to get all of the lymph nodes centrally down to the main blood vessel and resect an adequate length of bowel to include all of the pericolonic lymph nodes. And just to show an intraoperative picture of this, this shows quite an extensive dissection for a right-sided colectomy. Here's the duodenum down here. You can see the superior mesenteric vein, and this here is that lymph node packet for the right colon. So what are the outcomes for this type of surgical approach in colon cancer? So Dr. Hohenberger reviewed his patients over about a 25-year period with stage 1 through 3 colon cancer. And there was over 1,300 patients. These patients went, underwent surgery alone, so no adjuvant uh, therapies. And what they found is just with the change in surgical technique, they were able to improve local recurrence rates, and improve overall cancer outcomes. So really, kind of the conclusion of this first part of the talk is that surgery 
and surgical technique is important in these operations, and, and specifically proper lymphadenectomy techniques are important. And this is a very different operation when you're performing colon or rectal surgery for cancer versus when you're doing this for benign diseases. And proper technique really does improve surgical outcomes both in the short term and the long term from a cancer standpoint. So next I'm going to talk a little bit about laparoscopic colectomy and show you some data. There have been numerous randomized controlled trials looking at laparoscopic colectomy and comparing it to open colectomy, and I'll touch on these three uh, well-known and, and larger studies. The first study is called the COST trial. It was in North America with over 800 patients with a follow-up of seven years. The conversion rate to open surgery was approximately 20%. And again, you can see this was initially published in 2004, so this was in the early uh, days of laparoscopic colectomy. What they found was that the perioperative recovery was faster, meaning a shorter post-operative length of stay in the hospital, uh, less use of narcotics. But there were no overall differences in, in post-operative complications, 30-day mortality, uh, readmissions or reoperations. Looking at it from an oncologic standpoint, there was no difference in the five-year disease-free or overall survival, whether they underwent a laparoscopic colectomy or an open colectomy. And the conclusion from the authors was that laparoscopic colectomy for curable colon cancer was not inferior to open surgery based on these long-term oncologic endpoints. So similarly, the COLOR trial was a European study that accrued over 1,000 patients, followed them for nearly five years. Their conversion to open surgery was similar in the 20% range. And they found that there was no difference in the perioperative and surgical outcomes, meaning the resection margins, number of lymph nodes retrieved, and perioperative morbidity and mortality. When you looked at the oncologic outcomes, again, at three and five years, the cancer outcomes were similar, both disease-free and overall survival. Finally, the CLASSIC trial was a study from the UK of nearly 800 patients, two-to-one randomization. And what they reported was that the conversion to open surgery improved with surgical experience, as one would expect, and in their hands, the first year of the study, there was nearly a 40% conversion to open surgery, whereas this was less than 20% by the sixth year of the study. What they found was that the quality of life postoperatively and the recovery was better for those patients who underwent laparoscopic surgery, more minimally invasive surgery. This was, of the studies I presented, this was the one study that also included some rectal cancer patients, and I'll, I'll talk about this in more detail later on, but in this study they also reported on that subgroup of rectal cancer patients and showed that in those patients there was a higher positivity of <laughs> circumferential margins in those who underwent rectal cancer surgery with a laparoscopic approach, but they noted that this did not translate into a difference in longer-term outcomes as far as local recurrence. And this just shows that there was no difference, again, in this study with disease-free survival on the left side and overall survival on the right side. So now three studies that have shown oncologically laparoscopic colectomy is similar from a cancer standpoint to open colectomy. So we have these studies that have shown equivalency. And are we, as a surgical and medical community, utilizing laparoscopic colectomy? This just shows a couple of uh, studies that have been reported. One of them is from over six years ago from the Medicare data. And it showed that about a third of the patients underwent laparoscopic approach as opposed to an open approach. What we find is in a study that looked at uh, 2009 to 2012 from the national inpatient sample, over 300,000 patients, this number had improved, so over half of patients were undergoing a laparoscopic approach. And I would uh, guess that if we were to look at this today, 
that these numbers would even be higher as these approaches have become more prevalent, surgeons are more trained, uh, and the data is more well known. So I think we have a little bit of a ways to go, but it seems to me that we are uh, utilizing this approach. So in conclusion regarding laparoscopic colectomy, what I hope I've shown you is that the oncologic outcome is similar with a laparoscopic approach as it is to an open approach. And the benefit to patients is that using this minimally invasive technique, we're able to have some better short-term operative outcomes as far as pain control, length of stay, uh, and recovery. I'm going to now talk about minimally invasive approaches to rectal cancer. I'll talk about some studies, randomized studies for rectal cancer using laparoscopy. Now the COLOR2 study was just a follow-up of the COLOR study, so instead of looking at colon cancer, they focused on rectal cancer, and this was from eight European countries. They included patients with T1 through T3 rectal cancers. They excluded those patients who had uh, cancer within two millimeters of the endopelvic fascia based on either endoscopic ultrasound or MRI. They accrued over 1,000 patients in a two-to-one fashion. And what this group found is that the local regional recurrence was no different between the laparoscopic approach and open approach for rectal cancer, and that the disease-free survival and overall survival was no different. I'll now talk to you about two studies that were published just last year in the same journal, in the same uh, edition of JAMA, that have brought some controversy to this uh, field. So the first one is the ACASOG study. And this was a North American study at 35 institutions that looked at clinical stage two and three rectal cancers. All of these patients received neoadjuvant chemoradiation. You can see that it was uh, almost 460 patients in the study. The primary outcome of this study was surgical success. And the way that was dis defined is mentioned here. It's circumferential radial margins that are greater than a millimeter, distal margins that were clean, and completeness of total, mes total mesorectal excision. And, and just to mention, in, in rectal cancer surgery, where you're operating in the pelvis, and as I've mentioned, this circumferential packet of mesorectum is important from a surgical standpoint. Circumferential margins were really the problem, and that's been improved with total mesorectal excision. This is technically challenging with laparoscopy, and the question is, are we compromising the total mesorectal excision with the laparoscopic approach? They found an about 11% conversion rate to open surgery. There was no significant difference in some of the perioperative outcomes, such as length of stay, readmissions, and severe complications between the surgical approaches. Looking at their primary outcome of the study, which was overall surgical success, they sh showed that in the open resection arm, they were able to achieve surgical success by the definition I stated in about 87% of patients. And in the laparoscopic arm, it was in nearly 82% of the patients. And what the authors then concluded based on this data and their statistical analysis is that the laparoscopic resection for rectal cancer failed to meet the criterion for non-inferiority when you look at it from a pathologic outcome standpoint. And this, of course, is pending clinical oncologic outcomes in that they don't have data on five-year survival for these patients as far as does this manifest to a difference in local recurrence or overall survival? They stated that the findings currently did not support the use of laparoscopic resection in the patients. This study, as I mentioned, was published in the same edition of JAMA from Australia and Asia, nearly 500 patients. Half of them received neoadjuvant chemoradiation they used a similar primary outcome. So surgical success was the primary outcome. And it's defined similar to the prior study, complete total mesorectal rectal excision and clear circumferential and distal margins. 
the conversion to open was nearly 10%, similar to the prior study. And the numbers are remarkably similar to the prior study. So the overall surgical success rate was 89% in the open resection group and 82% in the laparoscopic resection group. And the authors concluded that these findings do not provide sufficient evidence for the routine use of laparoscopic surgery in rectal cancer. Again, with the caveat that recurrence and survival data, data had not matured, and, and we don't know if this, this pathologic finding is going to make a difference in the long-term outcome. But what I would say is that the publication of these two studies certainly brought about some controversy in this field and, and some reflection on what the proper technique is for rectal cancer surgery as far as a minimally invasive approach. As I've mentioned, laparoscopy does have some technical issues as far as the instrumentation and dealing uh, in the pelvis. And so there have been some other techniques that have been used and are, are being used for rectal cancer. And these include using the surgical robot. And so robotic rectal cancer surgery uh, is thought to be a way to overcome some of the limitations of laparoscopy. So what are some of the advantages of robotic surgery? So you have a 3D view when you're working. The range of motion is essentially that of your wrist. And so you've got full range of motion using the surgical robot as opposed to laparoscopy where you've got up, down, left, right. And that makes things a little bit easier when you're down in the pelvis, down in a deep, narrow hole. The motions are scaled down, so you can really do some fine dissection using the, the robot and it eliminates any natural tremor of the surgeon. Some of the disadvantages are there's no tactile feedback uh, using the robotic platform. Cost can be an issue, and this requires not only a specialized operating room team, but also requires a surgeon who's uh, trained and adept at using the surgical robot. There's no randomized data regarding robotic rectal cancer surgery, but some of the differences when compared with open surgery have been lower blood loss with less blood transfusions, shorter hospital stay, quicker bowel recovery, and this all comes at the cost of a little bit of a longer operative time. However, when we look at perioperative surgical complications and oncologic outcomes such as pathologic clearance, circumferential and distal margins, as well as longer-term survival of disease-free and overall survival. There's been uh, no difference when compared to open surgery. And again, with the caveat that this is not prospective randomized data, as was shown in the laparoscopic uh, rectal cancer uh, studies, but this is retrospective series from mostly single institutions. <coughs> So the robotic platform is one approach to try to help with some of the limitations of laparoscopy. Another approach is what's called a transanal TME, or a TOT TME, it's often uh, referred to. The idea here is to use both the laparoscopic approach coming from the transabdominal region and using a transanal approach in order to minimize the problems of operating deep in the pelvis. And again, pelvic dissections can be challenging, and more so in patients with narrow pelvis, which is often men, uh, patients with bulky tumors, and more obese patients can be challenging. The transanal approach is combined with the laparoscopic approach in this technique, and I'll show you uh, exactly what this means. So in this upper left picture, this shows the transanal component, and what happens is after the transabdominal portion has been performed, there's a resection that's done from below. And you essentially cut the rectum distal to the tumor. And so you've gone full thickness around the entire rectum beyond the tumor. So you know your distal margin is good. You so close the rectum. And then in this upper right, uh, I show you here, basically this is laparoscopic instrumentation. So this is a a single incision laparoscopic port. So this is placed transanally, and you can place multiple ports through this. 
and put a camera inside and use your routine laparoscopic instrumentation like you would use for any laparoscopic operation. And you're now performing a TME, trans total mesorectal excision, working from below, transanally. So you're coming next to your cut edge of the, the rectum. And so your goal is now to combine your dissection from below with the dissection you've performed from above so that you can more optimally work on that low pelvic uh, area, which tends to be the difficult area to work with laparoscopically. So this is a relatively new technique that we've been performing over the last few years. So the data is not mature, but there is retrospective data that compares this particularly to the laparoscopic approach. The oncologic outcomes particularly the pathologic outcomes, which was the reason to devise this technique, show that there is a higher rate of an intact mesorectal specimen and a lower rate of circumferential margin. So at least with the early data, it seems to be accomplishing getting a better pathologic clearance circumferentially and in the lower part of the rectum and the mesorectum. The number of lymph nodes and the distal margins are similar to laparoscopic surgery. And and as I've mentioned, the data is early and we don't have any long-term survival data yet. From a surgical standpoint, there's been no difference in complications, length of stay or readmissions compared to the laparoscopic approach. The operative times tend to be shorter because you're basically taking the most difficult part of the operation and trying to uh, make that a little simpler. And the rate, to convert, the rate of conversion to open surgery is lower as well, again, because you're working at that bottom portion now transanally rather than needing to make an open incision to get down there. So this is something that, you know, particularly at our institution, we have been using more and more over the past couple of years to try to overcome some of the limitations of laparoscopy, particularly with low rectal cancer. So what I've described so far has been what we would classically describe as radical rectal cancer surgery, meaning resecting the rectum, resecting the lymph nodes around the rectum, and then either making an anastomosis or giving somebody a, a colostomy or a temporary ileostomy. I'm going to talk a little bit now about local excision of rectal cancer, and typically this is for early stage rectal cancer. So radical surgery is certainly can be fraught with significant complications, and those can be wound complications, leakage from your anastomosis, sepsis, death, needing a permanent or temporary stoma, which can impact quality of life, and then other potential problems, such as urinary, sexual, or bowel dysfunction that can diminish quality of life. So for early stage cancers, you know, might we have a better approach? Local excision is associated with less postoperative pain, can often be done as an outpatient procedure, preserves normal bowel function without need for a stoma, and there's less associated perioperative morbidity. However, when we think about this, local excision is not removing any of the lymph nodes. And so we need to be aware of what is the risk of lymph node metastases in these patients. And so that's one factor. And other factors are we need to be aware of what are the patient's comorbidities, life expectancy, and exactly what the cost and benefit ratio is to the different options that we have. And so when we think about what are the risks of lymph node metastases, in T1 tumors, that risk is about 15%. In T2, T2 tumors, it's about 25%. And we can even subclassify the T1 tumors by what's called the Kikuchi classification, which essentially is top third, middle third, or bottom third of the submucosa. And we can see that if the T1 tumor is limited to the upper two thirds of the submucosa, the uh, rate of lymph node metastases is quite low, less than 10%. Once you get to that deeper third or closer to a T2 tumor, it essentially has the same risk as a T2 tumor. Uh, 
And these are important factors as we think about patients that we're going to subject to this procedure versus a more radical procedure. There are several different methods of performing transanal excision. This, uh, or I should say local excision. The, the top one I have here is transanal excision. Uh, this is typically done for the very low rectal tumors. And uh, basically in the operating room with retractors, you can see and operate on the very lowest part of the, of the rectum. Now the problem is you can't see anything much greater than about five centimeters or so. So you're limited with that approach. And so these other techniques have been uh, devised. One is what's called TEM, or transanal endoscopic microsurgery, which requires really this specialized uh, equipment here and specialized training. What we've been using more and more recently has been what's called TAMIS, or transanal minimally invasive surgery. The benefit of this is this is, again, uses standard laparoscopic equipment that, that every colorectal surgeon uses on a routine basis. And so it doesn't require um, these other instruments here, which tend to be uh, more cumbersome to use. And so using just a standard laparoscopic multiple port, you can perform a transanal excision. And you can get up to as high as about 12 or 15 centimeters. And so you're not limited to the lower part of the rectum. So local excision certainly has the benefit of being less morbid to patients. But as I mentioned, we're not taking the lymph nodes. And so it's not, you don't want to put a patient through a less morbid operation just to have their cancer reoccur in a year. That's certainly not the point here. So we need to be very careful in the patients that we select for this type of therapy. Different ways that we do this, one is based on physical exam. So if the tumor is less than three centimeters or less than 30% of the bowel circumference, it needs to be in the rectum, so within 15 centimeters of the dentate line, and it needs to be mobile, meaning not fixed to the deeper structures, because if, if it's fixed, that's a sign that it's a deeper tumor. This is essentially limited for the most part, to T1 tumors. So on either endoscopic ultrasound or MRI, we need to have evidence of T1 tumors, and the lymph nodes need to be clean. And finally, importantly, we limit this to the lower risk histologies. So patients who have either well or moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma absence of either lymphovascular invasion or perineural invasion, which those tend to be higher risk features, and no mucinous or signet cell components. Again, none of the high risk features. So really this uh, technique or procedure is best used in those patients with small T1 low risk rectal cancers that have a very low likelihood of spreading to the regional lymph, node, lymph nodes. This is a busy slide, but I'm going to direct you to the important areas here. Now, the, the table one shows single center studies, and table two shows national cancer registries. But when we look at five-year local recurrence, TAE is transanal excision, and SR is a standard resection, or a more radical resection, which includes the lymph nodes. And we see that the local recurrence is better with a more radical resection. Again, many of these are lymph node regional recurrences. And the five-year survival tends to be improved with a more radical resection. So these studies are really what these studies have shown us is what I tried to demonstrate in the prior slide, is that really patient selection is key and choosing the right patient based on the tumor as well as the patient's comorbidities and factors that are important to the patient will help you make the proper decision on who to use local excision for rectal cancer. So that, that was the, the um, just to summarize on the minimally invasive approaches, uh, 
You know, I would say that minimally invasive approaches in rectal cancer are still evolving, particularly with the new studies that were performed for laparoscopy. And so this is still an evolving area, I would say. But there are some exciting things like the robot and particularly the transanal laparoscopic combined approach in dealing with rectal cancer. So I'm, I've talked a little bit about primary colorectal cancer surgery, and hopefully I've highlighted some of the, the recent updates. I also wanted to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about colorectal liver metastases, because I think this is an important area, and an area where we see many patients, and surgery has definitely evolved over the past five and 10 years, and I think it's always important to, to kind of uh, be updated on this and understand that what the surgeon can do with this disease. This is significant in that colon cancer is common, 150,000 new cases approximately a year. Half of those patients will develop liver metastases. About 40% of those patients will have liver-only disease, so isolated to the liver. And so that gives us 30,000 patients annually approximately. And of those patients, about 20 to 25% of those patients are candidates for resection, so that's quite a number of patients. So when we think about metastatic colon cancer, untreated, it's fatal within a year. Now with modern systemic chemotherapy, you know, the outcomes really have improved to a median survival of two years, and, and I think with some of the newer regimens, even higher than that. Uh, but five-year survival with chemotherapy alone is still relatively rare. And in those patients who die with liver metastases, about 30 to 40 percent have liver-only metastases. And so this fact uh, had surgeons thinking even 20 or so years ago, well, might we benefit patients if we operatively remove the tumors out of the liver, since it is the only site of disease. And this is a, a study that essentially shows the natural history of hepatic metastases uh, uh, published in 1990. They looked at their patients at their institution and found that, you know, in the patients, nearly a thousand patients with unresectable hepatic metastases, the median survival was quite low. And again, this was before the era of modern chemotherapy, so we would expect this to be higher these days. Um, in those patients who had resectable liver metastases but did not undergo resection of those metastases, the median survival was 14 months and no five-year survivors. In those patients who did undergo surgical resection of the liver metastases with clear margins, the median survival was over two years and the five-year survival was nearly 40%. So quite a stark difference. When we look at the summary of outcomes really over the past 20 or so years that have been reported, and I'll just show you really a, a summary here. What we know is that you know, liver surgery is, is major surgery. The perioperative morbidity is about 30%. And some of that depends on exactly how extensive the liver surgery is. The perioperative mortality is in the one to 3% range. Again, if you do a major hepatectomy, it's more towards the 3% or so range. With a minor hepatectomy, it's much lower, even less than 1%. The median survival, when we look at all the studies, it's about 40%, and this is using modern chemotherapy. So again, with the advances in chemotherapy, the advances in surgery have you know, we've been able in a multidisciplinary approach to help these patients. Five-year survival is in the 30 to 50 percent range for these patients. And the 10-year survival is in the 15 to 20 percent range. And so because of what we've seen in the retrospective data, liver surgery for isolated liver metastases from colon cancer and rectal cancer it's considered the standard of care. And this is despite the fact that there's been no randomized phase three trials that have definitively proven this. But we've seen in the retrospective studies results that we would not expect to see otherwise. And so you know, I put this picture up because you don't need a randomized study to show that a parachute is beneficial if you're jumping off the cliff here. 
there are some issues when it comes to dealing with these patients with isolated liver metastases from colorectal cancer. And one is that the term resectable is not really well defined. And as one of my mentors would often say, resectability is in the eye of the beholder. And it, it really is. When we think about the indications for liver surgery, there's, to me, really the main determinant is, can I resect the tumors and leave the patient with enough liver to survive? And so it's really very much an anatomic consideration. And in a patient with a normal liver, you can remove up to 75% of the liver, and the liver will regenerate, and they'll, they'll be fine. In a patient who's been treated with chemotherapy, you often will like to leave more like 30% or so of the liver because the chemotherapy can affect the liver. Other reasons not to operate would be if a patient could not tolerate an operation because of performance status or other medical conditions. And with very rare exception, uh, we don't operate to resect liver metastases in a patient who has metastatic disease in other sites outside the liver. So I'm going to talk about some classical contraindications and try to tell you why those are really no longer pertinent. And so, you know, is surgery possible for somebody who's got bilobar disease? So if you have a tumor in the left liver and a tumor in the right liver, can you operate on that patient? If a patient has four metastases or even eight metastases in the liver, you know, can you or should you operate on that patient? So one of the advances is that we've learned about the surgical anatomy of the liver. Now on the left side, it's kind of the, in the anatomy books, your classical representation. And you know, 40 years ago, this was, the, this was what was known about the anatomy of the liver. We know a lot more about the surgical anatomy of the liver. And just to demonstrate some of the complexity there on the right side, you know, we, we've got eight segments of the liver inflow and outflow blood vessels and bile ducts. And as a surgeon, this is something I'm intimately familiar with. And knowing this anatomy, we now know that you don't need to remove the right half of the liver just because there's one tumor in the right liver or remove the entire left liver. So there's a much more nuanced approach. And with advances in surgical techniques in the liver, surgery has become much safer and we're able to do a lot of things that really weren't able to be done 10 or 15 years ago. And I'll just show you an example. So this is a 40-year-old woman who has these two uh, liver metastases from colon cancer. And they're both in the right side of the liver. So classically, this lady would have undergone a right hepatectomy. So this is removing 60% of her liver, high-risk operation, with high risk of morbidities and mortality. What we would do these days is we would remove segment seven of the liver, which is where that left-sided tumor sits, and that removes maybe 10% of the liver. And then I would do a minor wedge resection of that segment eight of the liver. And that is a much simpler operation for the patient to recover from. Preserves much more of the patient's liver and this, this type of technique has really helped. And because of these types of techniques, if we had one tumor or two tumors in the right liver and one or two tumors in the left liver, that does not mean we can't operate on them because we can remove portions of the liver without needing to remove major portions of the liver at once. And so these advances and this understanding of surgical anatomy as well as using ultrasound in the operating room to ba basically look inside the liver and see the anatomy have really helped us with these patients. So another common misconception I would say is that if you have four metastatic sites in the liver, that's too much to deal with. And from a biologic standpoint, certainly that is a higher risk patient. But that does not mean that they cannot undergo liver metastatectomy. Now, these are some studies from some large uh, centers, Memorial Sloan Kettering, MD Anderson, uh, 
and uh, a large group in France that has tried to address this question. And they've shown, again, in their selected patient population that you can have a five-year survival in about the 30% range or so. Now, these are high-risk patients, so 80% of them will reoccur, but we are extending their life by offering them liver surgery. So I've talked a little bit about resection or removing the tumors. We also have some other techniques to take care of tumors in the liver from colorectal cancer. And one is ablation, so thermal ablation, meaning burning the tumor. And this can be done in a multitude of ways. We can do it percutaneously, so with a needle under imaging guidance. We can do this laparoscopically, and we can do this with an open surgical approach. It's typically best used for tumors that are less than three centimeters. Those are the tumors that tend to have the best outcomes with this approach. There are different types of energy we can use. There's microwave energy, radio frequency energy. Those are both heat. Cryoablation is basically freezing the tumor. I would say the preferred approach, my preferred approach, and, and most uh, folks' preferred approach is to use microwave energy uh, these days. And this is a procedure that tends to have a, a very good morbidity and mortality with low, um, low rates of uh, perioperative problems. Now, this is a technique we can also combine with removing a tumor. And so this has become very useful for us, again, in dealing with specific types of tumors. And I'll show you an example here. Now, this is a patient with a very large right-sided tumor that's going to require removing the entire right lobe of the liver. But there's this deeper tumor on the left side that's smaller, but it's in a place where you can't resect this patient because you won't leave them with enough liver to survive the operation. And this is the kind of patient that can benefit from an approach where you remove the right half of the liver and then ablate that deeper tumor in the liver, basically burn that tumor, thereby preserving the majority of the left side of the liver so that they can survive the operation. Uh, finally, I'm going to talk about this um, approach just because a, a recent study was, uh, was published on this and just to make you aware of it. Now, this is called radioembolization. And what this means is it's using um, small particles that have radiation um, on the particles placed in through the hepatic artery by the interventional radiologist and into the liver. And they can be targeted either at the tumor sites or targeted on the side of the liver that the tumor is. And what they do is these particles go into the uh, small blood vessels, and they emit radiation for a short period of time, very localized radiation to try to treat the tumors. This is not a curative intent approach. So what I described before with removing the tumors or resecting the tumors, as well as ablating the tumors, will completely get rid of those tumors, and we use that as what we would call a curative intent. This is palliation, so this typically does not entirely kill the tumors, and it's often used for patients who are not uh, candidates for resection and ablation. But the reason I want to mention it is that it was recently reported in a randomized phase three study that used chemotherapy alone or chemotherapy in addition to this liver-directed radioembolization. And what they found was improved progression-free survival in the liver itself. Despite that, however, they didn't really find a difference in progression-free survival when you looked at all sites, which makes sense. You're basically adding liver-directed treatment to an already systemic treatment. So you're not adding anything systemically, but you're focusing on the, the liver itself. And so this is a good option to use in patients who have unresectable uh, disease in the liver. Regarding uh, colorectal metastases to the liver, to summarize this portion of the, of the talk, you know, surgery, in addition to chemotherapy, so in a multidisciplinary approach, it's, it's effective treatment for these patients. 
surgery is safe. So, you know, folks who remember liver surgery from 10, 15, 20 years ago, you know, liver surgery is not that way anymore. It's still high risk, but it's certainly not what it was in the past. Um, patient selection is complex, and I would argue that all of these patients with isolated liver metastases should be evaluated by a liver surgeon and by a multidisciplinary uh, cancer center for decisions. To summarize essentially the, the entire talk, just to kind of highlight the points that I was trying to make, total mesorectal excision and complete mesocolic excision, I think the key concept is proper cancer surgery, oncologic lymphadenectomy is important and surgical technique is important for these patients. As far as laparoscopic colectomy, it's a, it's in my opinion for patients who are candidates for laparoscopic colectomy, that should be the preferred approach because of the improvement in perioperative outcomes and no difference in the cancer outcomes long term. Minimally invasive rectal cancer surgery is I think still in evolution and there's ongoing studies and there will be updates on some of the studies to better define exactly which approaches will fit which patient. And so I think in those cases we're going to often have a very individualized approach. And for colorectal liver metastases I would say um, we've come a long way in that field and, and some of the misconceptions from 10 or so years ago still live on and hopefully I've tried to abate some of those. Thank you. The, the most interesting, for me, the most interesting thing to talk is there's a lot of choices to be made. At the start. Yeah. And yeah, we rely on the doctor, but you've got to somehow let the patient in on that. Because basically, there's trade-offs on three things. The cure will work at the end, the recovery from the surgery, and then the quality of the life thereafter. And I guess, I mean, there are a couple of things. For example, you all have a great uh, duty to try to explain this to patients. And, I, and of course, the patient's not very knowledgeable. One thing I, I think I learned this from you, I thought laparoscopic and robotic were similar. But I gather they're not. Yeah, they're, so they're similar but different. The laparoscopic equipment is different than the, the robot itself is basically an extension of minimally invasive surgery, but it's robotic arms that are placed in the patient. You actually, as the surgeon, you sit at a console to control the arms as opposed to laparoscopy where you're at the patient holding the instruments. Well, you're holding, yeah. But I thought they were yeah. the same. Yeah, they're, they're different. And from what I learned from this, if yeah. I had my choice, somebody said laparoscopic or robotic, I should choose robotic. Okay. I would say... General? I would say that we're not 100% sure yet what the final verdict will be, but I would say, you know, what, what I think the general recommendation has been is certainly for the lower rectal cancers where the laparoscopic tends to be more difficult, what we've, we've started to do is use more of the transanal and laparoscopic combined approach, mainly, you know, for lots of reasons, but part of it is it's a natural extension for a surgeon to do laparoscopy in the abdomen, and then it's basically a laparoscopic approach transanally, as opposed to you know, having a team and having the surgeon to learn how to use the robot, which in and of itself takes some learning. And so that's, I think we've gone more to using that approach. One of the other reasons is we have one robot, and it's hard to get on it as a surgeon, so that's, you don't want to. That's always the issue of equipment. Exactly. And, and so from a practical standpoint, um, the combined laparoscopic and transanal approach. So I agree with you, for the low cancers, I would say either a combined transanal or combined transanal laparoscopic approach or a robotic approach right now seems to be the better way to do it for a low-lying rectal cancer. And, uh, and the other finding that I think I learned was I think, uh, Dr. Keller, when we have uh, uh, prostate 
about cancer on that thing. I think I learned, if it would help me if I'm wrong, that, that laparoscopic, just like you showed, laparoscopic was every bit as good for some colon cancers. I think prostate it showed laparoscopic was as good as a radical under the yeah. right circumstances. Yeah. The recovery period was better. Yeah, for so generally speaking. Yeah. So generally speaking, exactly. So whenever possible, a laparoscopic approach, I think, is the preferred well, approach well, for that. Is, is there are a million choices up there. You guys, so. are best, you guys are best positioned to help make that decision. But there's some things you've got to leave to the patient. And I, so, hope, I hope you all, and I hope everybody out here understand that. So a new rectal cancer patient shouldn't be blocked in for a 15-minute time slot. That's, that's <laughs> probably yeah. You know, it requires more like an hour. Hello, I'm Vinia Hella, I'm a surgeon oncologist here in Howard. I have been doing a lot of robotic vacuum surgery, but I think it was a great talk really covering important surgical perspective, especially for the non surgeon. I want to make one point about the robotics. Mm -hmm. There is a randomized trial, and I know it's probably not published yet, yet which is the Roller trial. The randomized more than 800 laparoscopic versus robotic cases is a multinational and international trial. It has non inferiority of robotics over laparoscopy. It shows a lower conversion rate, especially for low rectal cancers, as you said, it, especially in the obese patient. I published this uh, myself a prospective trial of more than 250 robotic areas, and I think the big benefit is the conversion rate. You cannot reach the low pelvis laparoscopically in an obese male, and you have to be open, it can be very challenging. Mm -hmm. So, I do, I am a believer in robotics, also in my lifetime of doing surgery. I can actually sit down, there's a struggle with the laparoscopic instruments. Learning curves are for both, mm -hmm. not just the bubble. I do everything completely robotically, but you know, you have to be a very advanced laparoscopic surgeon to be able to do a laparoscopic rectal surgery. And now, coming to my question. How difficult and how high is the learning curve for these transgenal kidneys? Because I cannot imagine for an obese patient to come from below is easier than coming from me from the top down is the robot. That was not my question. And the second question regard to uh, liver metastasis. So I agree, every patient should be seen by a multidisciplinary team, including the surgeon, even if they have more than four or five lesions, because the surgeon may still be able to remove those lesions. How are you using the perioperative chemotherapy approach? I know there's no one my stride, but I'm depending to what I use perioperative chemotherapy, how many cycles, how do you approach those patients? Thanks. Thank you. So, um, very good question. So, the, the first question as far as the learning curve for the transanal approach, um, it's hard to say. I mean, I think we've at our institution probably done in the range of maybe 20 to 30 in the last few years, and certainly the first several were two surgeon approaches, just to get an understanding of it. And I th um, So I don't know if I can answer to you how long it actually takes to become proficient at it, but, but there is, you know, that plane does open up, and, you know, if you've done, if you've gone as low as you can from the top, uh, certainly that's where you can kind of make that, it becomes easier to kind of see that plane and come from below. Um, as far as the um, second question, uh, when it comes to the patient with liver metastases, it's, it's, it's hard to give a one answer. You know, I think it's a very individualized approach as far as how you treat the perioperative chemotherapy. The, the one study that has looked at that from a randomized manner has shown really no difference in overall survival, giving perioperative chemotherapy, you know, around the time of liver surgery, showed about a 7% progression-free survival at three years. And the way we typically will use it, so it, for patients who present with synchronous colon or rectal cancer plus liver metastases, those patients will all undergo chemotherapy up front prior to having any surgery. Um, in those patients who present early on after their colorectal surgery or who present with multiple tumors in the liver or tumors that you feel like if you could downsize them, the liver operation would be much easier, we tend to treat those patients with 
uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. In those patients who present with a metachronous tumor, so one or two tumors two years out from their initial surgery, um, we'll often take those patients to surgery first and then let them get their chemotherapy afterwards. So that's kind of been our general approach based on you know, the, the data that's out there. Jerry hit a, an important point, the, the, the patient selection, um, but also coming from the patient. And I know several patients who are elderly, they wouldn't fit the colon cancer screening guidelines. They're over 85, yet they have a T1 or T2 uh, colon cancer. And I was wondering if you had experience of um, consulting them for doing, or if you can comment on the morbidity of a transanal um, approach um, or a, um, a limited resection where you're not doing a total no dissection transanally uh, versus doing no surgery at all. Because oftentimes, oftentimes I've seen these people go on to just low dose alota or low dose chemotherapy after they become more symptomatic. Um, so it's a good question, and it's a, it is a difficult scenario. I think in the, the elderly patient with comorbidities with a rectal tumor, you know, certainly for a T1, we would opt for a transanal or a, a local excision uh, rather than doing a radical surgery. Um, you know, there are scenarios where even in a T2 tumor where preoperative imaging shows that the lymph nodes look clean, that we may consider doing a transanal, you know, local excision in those patients as well because of the reasons you mentioned. They may not tolerate a radical operation, and in this manner at least you're giving them some local control. And if they truly haven't spread to the lymph nodes, you may give them definitive control. Sometimes we do talk about as in the tumor board whether or not to give them radiation in addition, and that's that's always a discussion, so I don't have a good answer to that. The um, colon cancer is a little different, and I would say as a group, we tend to be a little bit more aggressive, even in the elderly patients, you know, the 80, 88, 89-year-old patient who needs a right colectomy, because um, that can often be performed laparoscopic, and, you know, if the patient seems like they can tolerate it, we've tend, tended to do that. And so, unless they just seem very unfit for surgery, you know, we've, we've tended to be a little bit aggressive on those patients. There are some patients who may have um, a low-grade T2 or T1 colon cancer um, who we didn't think could tolerate it, where we basically opted for um, polypectomies, tattooing, and monitoring. So. Um, it's always a very individualized approach. And so we, we, for the rectals, we tend less is more. For the colons, it just depends on the situation. And then a, a second question, and I'm gonna open this up to other members in the panel too. Um, you know, talking about metastatic disease in the liver, um, all the options you mentioned, also radiosurgery has been used for lesions that aren't surgically accessible or patients who are not good operative candidates. Um, but there's always the question of whether to follow any uh, metastectomy with additional chemotherapy. And I know practices vary across the nation. So I wanted to open it up to you and the rest of the panel, what um, you do at your institutions. Yeah, so this is another tough question. Um, there's no standard approach. You know, I think in, in the patients that we've opted to give neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we usually do six cycles before, six cycles after. Um, some of the patients we talk to beforehand about doing surgery first, followed by chemotherapy, you know, not based on great data, but based on the fact that in stage three patients who undergo complete resection, there seems to be a benefit to adjuvant chemotherapy, and we've extrapolated that somewhat. Um, that being said, there are some patients who, you know, particularly who have completed their adjuvant chemotherapy, so 12 cycles of chemotherapy after stage three colon cancer, and a liver metastasis pops up six months later. You know, that might be a patient where we resect them, and then the idea is, well, they just completed their adjuvant chemotherapy, um, we'll monitor them at this point, rather than give them additional chemotherapy. So it's, uh, 
we don't have a straightforward answer, but that's kind of the general approach. So in Philadelphia, we do very similar things. We will, I'm a medical oncologist, and of course, this is how I make my living, is giving chemotherapy. Nonetheless, we do only six months of chemotherapy, and that's six months doctor time, right? So you, about three months before, then surgery, and then three months later, also based on the idea that that is the ideal amount of time that reduces the risk of micrometastases that could then grow to make metachronous tumors in the liver or anywhere else. No great data to support that, but that's what we do. We try to keep the surgeons happy, so don't damage the liver too much with chemotherapy pre-op, but we don't think that three months is adequate. So three months, surgery, three additional months, and call it a day. I'm Chris Willett, I'm a radiation oncologist, and uh, our policies are very similar, identical to what's been described. I would like to, however, just to make a, a couple of comments about the use of stereotactic body radiation therapy for hepatic metastases. John's commented on some ablative approaches, uh, and more recently there's increasing experience with the use of stereotactic body radiation therapy, which is typically administered in three to five or, or up to ten treatments with very close image guidance radiation therapy. And the data that's being accrued, developed, uh, shows really quite promising results uh, with this as an alternative approach to uh, potentially surgery, but other ablative approaches as well. So. Uh, as John has commented on, there are many approaches now towards uh, treatment of hepatic metastases. May I ask one more question? Yes. Um, in terms of surgery, do you have any difficulties with payers uh, allowing you to do one type of operation or another? In Philadelphia, there's a palpable distrust of the payers, and I'm wondering whether in Cleveland it's a little bit easier to get whatever you want done, approved, prior to the surgery. Um, we, we haven't had any issues with from the surgical side. I think sometimes, depending on the, the, met, the chemotherapy regimens, they may have a little bit more difficulty, um, but we haven't had any issues from the surgery side. No, not really. Thanks. Are there any additional questions? Thank you very much.